about your childhood in Smithtown, Pennsylvania. Smithtown, Smith Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania. Well, it was a wonderful one, to say the least. Uh, you know, living in a small town, growing up in a small town, being an only child in a small town, it was very thrilling. I mean, uh, I had a lot of friends. My grandmother lived next door, so I was with my grandmother daily. And um, everybody says, well, wasn't it lonely being an only child? But my grandmother had eight children, and I had cousins to play with. Uh, all over the place. You know, we had family reunions. And you could walk at night. I would run up to my girlfriend's house, you know, at 7 o'clock at night. We'd play a, a game called Kitty in the Corner, you know, out at night. So it was wonderful. It was a great way to raise kids. I mean, I've often wished that I could have raised my children in a small town. Did you go to the movie theater a lot as a child? I went to the movie theater every weekend. They only played on weekends. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but they would have matinees as well. It was a Sunday matinee, a Saturday matinee, and um, so the week, when the weekend would come, I would be there for all five performances, and uh, from the time I can remember. I mean, I remember sitting in the first row with my friends, you know, and I must have been four or five years old, you know, loving the movies, loving them. And who were some of your idols back then? Well, even then, I, I loved the, the musicals, and that's when all the MGM musicals were big. And of course, my idols were Judy Garland and Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly and Debbie Reynolds, strangely enough, even though we were about the same age. Um, but yeah, all the musicals I remember. I remember the first musical, Gene Kelly was from Pittsburgh, and of course, Pittsburgh is about 30 miles from my small town of Smithton. Pittsburgh is the big city. And everybody knew Gene Kelly, and I remember seeing his very first film, which was a film called For Me and My Gal with Judy Garland, and that was his first motion picture, and it was so exciting. I'll never forget that, because he was sort of from my hometown, you know. And Lana Turner, was she a big idol of yours when you were growing up? Lana Turner was, to me, the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, yes, I loved her looks, I loved her personality, loved the kinds of movies that she was in. and. Uh, wanted to be her, you know. <laughs> and we were talking a little bit before the cameras were rolling about how you won a beauty contest. And can you talk to me a little bit about that contest and what it did for you, how it opened the door for you in acting? Well, I, I was always able to sing. It was, a, it was a gift. I was singing when I was four and five years old, you know, the youngest member of the church choir in my little town. And uh, about age 12, my parents decided that I should have formal singing lessons. So at once a week, at least once a week, we would drive to Pittsburgh, 30 miles from Smithton, and I would take a singing lesson. And my teacher there was a man by the name of Ralph Luando, who later went on to teach at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And <clears throat> I was studying with him, and I guess I was about, just turned 17, as I recall, maybe not even that old. And they were going to have the Miss Pittsburgh contest, uh, a la Miss America, you know. Miss Pennsylvania, Miss America. And he said to my parents, he said, I would like to enter your, your daughter. You had to have a sponsor. I would like to enter your daughter in the contest. And of course, you had to have a talent. I mean, that was the main thing. And that was bigger than anything. I mean, the bathing suit, yes. But, you know, mostly his interest in me was the talent. And he felt that I really had something to offer. So they agreed. And he entered me in the contest. And of course, I sang as my talent naturally. And I won. And. Uh, went on for the Miss Pennsylvania, and I came in second. I was the first runner-up, didn't win. And in many ways, that was a godsend, because from then on, uh, I I'd received a, a scholarship at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And so I had my last year in high school and studied during the summers at the Playhouse and uh, did the usual thing that you do as a an award winner, uh, Miss Pittsburgh. And, uh, and then after I graduated high school, I was on my way to college. I was going to a college in New Jersey. And we stopped in New York, and I knew a pianist there by the name of Ken Welch, who had played for me at the Playhouse. And I called him, and, well, it's a long story, but I went and sang for Rodgers and Hammerstein's casting director, and uh, got into a show called South Pacific, never got to college. And within the year, I was playing the lead in Oklahoma. So 
That's how it happened. And didn't he come and when they heard you sing, run and get Oscar um, and say, come listen to her, come listen to her? It was really an incredible thing that happened. It's the so-called Cinderella story of all time, you know. It was open auditions where anybody could go and sing for the casting director at least once a week because they had three shows running on Broadway. And they ran so long they'd have to keep replacing the chorus people. So I went in, my very first professional audition, I didn't, I'd never auditioned for anything. I was, you know, not even 18. And um, I sang for the casting director. He called Richard Rogers in, who just happened to be, you, you talk about a serendipitous situation, just happened to be across the street rehearsing his orchestra for Oklahoma, which was about to open at city center and go out on another tour. And he said, I want him to hear you personally. Richard Rogers came in. I didn't even know who these two men were, really. I mean, I knew their music, of course, but I wasn't sure what they looked like or anything like that. And I was very young, very naive. And uh, Rogers came in. I sang for him. And he said, would you mind waiting 20 minutes? I'm going to call my partner, Oscar Hammerstein, at home, have him come and hear you. And uh, my pianist, Kenny, said, surely I have to catch an airplane. I can't wait. It was a Thanksgiving. It was a holiday. I believe Thanksgiving weekend. And he said, uh, Richard Rogers said, well, never mind. When Oscar arrives, we have a full orchestra across the street. You can come and sing with the City Center Symphony. Now, I'd never heard a symphony, seen a symphony, let alone sing with one. Oscar arrived, and he said, do you know the score of Oklahoma? And I said, well, I know the music, but I don't know the lyrics. Of course, I'm speaking to the lyricist. And he said, never mind, I have a score. Handed me a score, took me across the street. I stood with the score in front of my face, knees shaking, and sang three songs from Oklahoma with the City Center Symphony. And out of that, they said, uh, what are your plans? I said, I'm going to college. And they said, no, you're not. You're going to go into a show called South Pacific. <laughs> and within the next week, uh, of course, it took a lot of, you know, talking with my parents. And I then signed with an agent, and, you know, it was the usual thing. And uh, I went into the chorus of South Pacific, the last six months of the Broadway show. Um, they signed me to do another show called Me and Juliet. In the meantime, they were preparing the motion picture of Oklahoma, which I was not aware of. And they had me come and read and sing for the producers, the Hollywood people. I went to Chicago with the sh Me and Juliet. And while I was there, they called and said they wanted to test me and would I fly to California. And so within the year, uh, which is remarkable. I was starring in a major, major motion picture opposite Gordon McRae, playing Laurie. And I've read that so many people are taking credit for your, you know, your screen role. I think Mike Todd and I have a name, Gus Schwimmer. Gus Schirmer. Schirmer. Yes. And Oscar, who do you give credit for discovering you? Well, actually, it was Gus Schirmer. Gus Schirmer was was my agent, and when I had gone to New York on the, on the holiday and called Kenny. He's, the first thing he said before I, he said, let's go and do the audition, he said, I want you to meet this agent friend of mine by the name of Gus Shermer, of the Shermer Music People. And Gus was a one-man, you know, little agent uh, with, what, you know, one other lady with him, a wonderful lady, just the two of them. And he said to my parents, talked to my parents, and he said, I would like to sign Shirley for a one-year contract. And he said, under the contract, he said, uh, you know, she can go, I'll send her to auditions, this being the first one. And uh, he said, uh, told me how to dress and what to do. And, you know, he had heard me sing, of course. And he said, I know that I can keep her working. I was the one, that, by the way, which is very interesting when I talk to young people today. I was the one that insisted on going to college. I didn't want to stay and do that. I wanted to go on to school because I was fearful that, I wouldn't make it, and you know, I didn't want my parents to have to keep me in New York City. And my parents, again, this was an unusual thing, they were the ones that said, no, try it. You can always go to school, which I think parents would never say today, you know. I, mean, I didn't say it to my kids. I know that. <laughs> of course, they all ended up in show business. <laughs> That's great. And here you are, like you said, 18 years old, <clears throat> going to Hollywood. Now, I know Oklahoma wasn't filmed there. How long were you in Hollywood? before you went to, it was in Arizona where the film was shot. Yes. And what was that like for you? Oh, it was a whirlwind. It was a whirlwind. Uh, as I said, I, I was in Chicago doing the show Me and Juliet, flew to California to test for, for the role of Laurie. Two weeks later, I was back in Chicago and my agent called and said, hello, Laurie, you know. And uh, right then and there, I 
within the next, I guess, week or two, um, they flew me to California and I had to get an apartment. I had to get a place to live. I stayed initially in, in the Del Capri Hotel, a little hotel on Wilshire Boulevard. And then uh, I decided I better get some kind of a little apartment. And Westwood Village was wonderful because there was a lot of young people there, so I got a little apartment there. And, and a girlfriend of mine that I knew in New York came, flew to California and she became my roommate. She was a singer as well. So here we are, these, you know, it was like my sister Eileen, these two young girls, you know, in their first apartment. But as you just said, I didn't stay in, in Hollywood that long. I was there, got the apartment, uh, did all the costume fittings, uh, did all the wardrobe, did all the pre-recordings. You know, that's when they pre-recorded all the songs. Did all that. So I guess I was in, in Hollywood probably about a month, six weeks, before we went on location. And uh, then the, long the location was long. I mean, we were in Nogales, Arizona for eight, nine months. You know, that's when it took a year to make a motion picture musical, at least. And um, so I was there a long time. Oops. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Put a little sound. Sound speed. Excuse me. Can you get through? Right. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we were talking just now about how you signed a five-year contract with Rodgers and Hammerstein. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what the difference is between signing with them versus signing with a big studio like MGM? Well, this was their own production, Oklahoma. This was uh, 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 done solely, you know, through their own uh, auspices, and they didn't want a studio to do it. Now, we yes, we did film some of it at MGM, but um, this was an independent production. And um, they did all the casting, they were on set every single moment, you know, every day in the hot sun. They were both down there in Arizona, in Nogales, and uh, uh, so when they decided that I was to be the one to play Laurie, um, they had other features in mind, obviously, at that time, too. I think Carousel was one that they were talking about and South Pacific. They were thinking about doing all of their sh their, their shows and making them into, into uh, uh, movies. And so they decided they'd better sign me to a contract. Now, I was the first and last one and only ever to be put under contract to Rogers and Hammerstein, and it was a five-year contract. And uh, so, of course, I was very excited and very willing, you know, and uh, signed the contract. And then under the contract, I did... Oklahoma, uh, the film, did a whole PR tour for a year, and then did Oklahoma on the stage, which was also a part of that contract. At that time, they were sending a company to Europe. It was called a Salute to France program, and ANTA was sending, it would send one musical, one, one uh, ballet, one opera, one play, and Oklahoma was the musical. And that's where I met Jack Cassidy, who played Curly, my first husband, and uh, Rod Steiger was in the rehearsals with us, but he didn't end up doing the show, of course. You know, he played Judd in the film. Um, but that was a wonderful experience because Ruben Mamoulian directed that company of Oklahoma, and he was the original director of Oklahoma when it opened in 1943, I believe it was, on Broadway. And so it was interesting to work with him after working with Fred Zinneman, who was basically a motion picture director. And uh, so I did that, and then I came back to do Carousel, uh, while I was in Europe, they called and said that they were casting me in Carousel. But they did not actually produce Carousel. They were still, you know, had to be, um, had the casting. Uh, they, were, they did all the casting, but they didn't actually produce it as they did Oklahoma. 20th Century Fox, they gave it to 20th Century Fox, and so we did it at Fox. And then that was sort of the end of my contract after I did Carousel. But it was a five-year contract. It lasted about three years, I guess. Do you think you missed out at all as an actress not being in the studio system? I think the studio system was pretty much done. Right at the, the end. Yeah. It was right at the end of the studio system when I came in. No, I feel very fortunate that, that I was not under contract to a studio. Um, I got to kind of do what I wanted to do. I was independent and being an only child, I'm very independent anyway, so being told what to do was something that was not easy for me. And I found that out when I started in, in, in movies. Um, so I felt very fortunate that it was Rodgers and Hammerstein, you know, and, and not a studio. And tell me a little bit about shooting in Arizona. What was needed to make Arizona look like 
Oklahoma. And I, I know there's a corn story where they're planting the corn mm -hmm. to make it really tall. Can you talk a little bit about they that? They started, they, they chose... I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry again. Okay. They, um, they chose Arizona instead of Oklahoma. I mean, everybody says it wasn't done at all. I said, no. Uh, because it wasn't, uh, you, you know, there were no telephone wires. They, they had open space there. It was Nogales, which was on the border of Mexico. And that uh, was wide open spaces. So a year or two before, uh, they had scouted the location. And they planted the corn. They planted the corn. They built the farmhouse. Um, they did everything. I mean, it was a, it was a legitimate set. I mean, I mean, there were bedrooms. It was a house. And, and the, and the um, smokehouse, you know, where Judd lived, they, they built that and uh, planted the cornfield, as I said. So it was beautiful. I mean, you could live there. And uh, we all stayed at a little hotel, you know, a little motel, actually, nearby. But that was, that became our home. And that was at the time when you worked, when actors worked 15, 16-hour days, you know, and seven days a week. That's before the unions came in and said, no, you can't work like that. But uh, it was hard work. I remember it well. I mean, and we had a lot of rain outs. They, they chose the rainy season. This always, I, I always found this so fascinating that they would choose the rainy season. But they wanted the beautiful cloud formation. So they said, well, we'll take our chances. Well, a lot of rain came. So that's one of the reasons we were there a long time as well. We had to reshoot a lot of stuff and all of that. But that's why it was Arizona. Well, here you are, you were saying about 18, 19 years old, and you're working with Rod Steiger, and Rod Steiger can be a little intimidating, a little harsh at first, but you guys became really good friends. Can you talk about working with Rod a little bit for me, please? Well, I admired Rod a lot. I mean, he, he was from the actor's studio, you know. I mean, I he was this little girl from Pittsburgh that went to the Pittsburgh Playhouse during the summer. So I admired him as an actor. I, I, uh, yes, he was a bit intimidating, but he was very sweet to me. And Fred Zinneman, who was the director of the film, I was the youngest member, you know, I was just really a kid. And so he had told, Fred had told everybody on the set, you know, uh, Charlotte Greenwood played Aunt Eller and she was like a mama to me during that time. And, um, but had told everybody on the set now, no hanky-panky, she's very young, she's very naive. Take care of her like you would your own, you know, sister or child or whatever. And particularly Rod, I think he gave, he said that to him more than anybody else. So Rod felt that and, uh, and was very sweet. I mean, we used to sit, he used to tell me about acting and how he got into it. And he loved poetry and he would sit for hours. He was fascinating to me because as I said, I never met anybody like that. And he would read, read me poetry, you know, and it was very sweet. So, yeah, I loved Rod. We, we got along very well. And then when we did, uh, my husband Jack Cassidy had worked with Rod as well. And uh, they became friends, too. So we stayed friends. Well, why do you think he was cast? Because here he is, you know, a, we were saying before, a guy who really can't dance. Yeah. Singing, he's not really known to be a singer. No. And why do you think Fred cast him in this role? I think... The, the fact is, you know, Fred Zinneman had not done a musical. I mean, this was a first for him, too. He had done From Here to Eternity and The Nun Story and, you know, wonderful, dramatic films. Uh, but was it was perfect for him to be able to do this. I think that's why Oklahoma was so good. Because sometimes when you, when you take a stage musical and put it on the screen, it doesn't quite work as well. And Oklahoma worked because he did that, because he chose somebody like Rod Steiger and Gloria Graham, you know. And the fact that Rodgers and Hammerstein went along with it, I mean, I think they were in favor of that as well. Yes, they wanted singers. They had me. They had Gordon McRae. But then they wanted that other side. They, did, they wanted a little darkness in the story, and they got the darkness with Rod. And I think that's what Fred wanted, too. And tell me a little bit about working with Fred, because I love what you just said about how you know, here you are in your first film, and thank God you got to work with a director like him. Oh, I was so fortunate, so fortunate, because I had not done anything. I mean, I had never done a film. The interesting thing is when I came, I was, again, very fortunate, because when I came out to test, to screen test, I tested with Gordon McRae, who was screen testing for, for the role of Curly, and Fred Zinneman directed the test. Now, normally, uh, it was always my... Uh, uh, thought that when you came out to test you got an assistant director and you got somebody just to play the part opposite you but I had uh, all of them and when we finished the test uh, Fred said to me have you ever acted before a camera before and I said no 
And he said, don't change anything. He said, you're the most natural actress I've ever seen before a camera. So from that day on, you know, he was marvelous with me because he knew that I was very green, didn't know much. And so he was kind of Svengali. And thank heaven, if you have a Svengali, you have somebody like Fred Zinnemann, you know, because he liked actors. He worked with actors. He had been a film editor and he knew what to look for, you know. And so I felt very fortunate. And anytime he gave me a direction, it was always a wonderful one. And, you know, he was kind and good. So I was very fortunate to have him. That's great. And I also read that James. Oh, perfect. How much longer? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I'm going to ask this and see if you can do it two minutes. Okay. If not, we'll switch. That James Dean tried out for the role of Curly. They had a lot of actors try out for the role of Curly. When they were thinking of, you know, as I said, we could dub the voices in at that time, and that's what we did. I mean, there were a lot of, they did musicals, and a lot of actresses didn't sing, and they would have somebody else do the singing. Um, yes, I think he was one of them that they, that they wanted. I believe he even tested, screen tested. But they decided, when I say they, I think it was Rodgers and Hammerstein. They wanted a singer. That's great. Okay, I'm going to have you switch, if that's okay. About a minute and a half. Okay, I'm trying to think of an easy... Okay, how about Agnes DeMille? I'm trying to go to a question that's an easy <laughs> one. Or not easy, but that can be sh um, short. Can you talk about working with Agnes DeMille? I know she was on the set a lot. Agnes was a real professional lady. I mean, and there was no ifs, ands, or buts. She said, this is what you're going to do. That's what you did. And she and the director, by the way, and Fred, you know, had his way of doing things, too. And they got into it a lot. I mean, she would walk off the set in a huff, you know. Come back, but she'd walk off the set. But she was very kind to me. She, would, she knew that I wasn't a dancer, basically. Um, and she said, don't worry about it, sweetheart. She said, we'll put you in a situation where you'll look like you'll dance very well. <laughs> so I liked her a lot. She was wonderful with me. So great. That's great.